If you think that adversity means it's game over, it's time to think again on today's episode. You are listening to the Champion Hustle Podcast. Play to succeed in business and in life. Featuring Levi Hunsaker and Ryan Black. Hello and welcome to the Champion Hustle Podcast. This is episode number 43. My name is Ryan Black. And my name is Levi Hunsaker. Levi, good morning. Good morning, Ryan. I'm excited today. We have a, a special guest joining us, um, but before we jump into that, we want to remind you about um, this event that we have coming up in May about uh, really learning how to make profits again in your business, to level that up, to uh, learn tips and tricks from six, seven, eight figure earners on how they run their business and how they have kept their business profitable through this last year and what it's gonna look like going forward into 2021. So you wanna make sure that you go to championhustle.com forward slash summit to get access and, and we have a special gift for you with that. If you join us live at the event, you actually get to do it for free. You get access to the videos for free for the first 24 hours and after that, um, then you gotta figure out how you're gonna to continue to get access for them. But there'll be more details to come, but head over to championhustle.com forward slash summit, and you can join us live during this four day event in May. Yes, oh, it's gonna be an awesome one. Now today, as you guys know, on some episodes, sometimes we have special guests with us. And today we are fortunate enough to have a very special guest with us. Now normally we do a nice intro, we talk about who they are and what they've done and how they've helped us and, and that's why they've you know qualified to be with us on the show. Today, we're gonna throw that all out the window. It's going down. Why? Because today's guest is somebody who is, uh, how would we say? Unconventional. <laughs> his results <laughs> that's, speak that's for- That's one way to put it. <laughs> his results speak for themselves. All I gotta say, I know what I'm gonna say is, I have trained and coached with this man twice, and both times I did that, the sales in my businesses, two different businesses, doubled, thanks to working with this guy. He's incredible. I'm not gonna give him more of an intro than that. Le <laughs> Levi, it is our pleasure to welcome on the show today, Mr. Woody Woodward. Woody, awesome to have you here with us. Ryan, Good Levi, it's so Woody. great to be here, my friends. Thank you so much. And I like the introduction. I like it just plain and simple. Let's just get down to brass tacks. Let's make this thing happen. So I just want to hit you with a question right off the bat, okay? Your story, your history is very interesting. In a, in a nutshell, you went from millions to bankrupt to millions again. So way up here to as low as you can go to way up again. That journey for most people would be a, a game over. It would be devastating. That is some adversity. How did you come out of that? In, in going through that journey, talk to us about that. How did you overcome such an emotional, traumatic journey of top of the world to what some people would consider, it's I'm done. I'm, I'm done to, to going back on top again. Heavy medication. Heavy, heavy <laughs> medication. That's the only way through. No, uh, man, I, li I like going to the hard stuff first. All right, so it boils down to this is, you know, dropped out of high school at 16, it was a millionaire at 26, broke at 27, then I made it back in my 30s, and in the whole 2008, the housing market crash is when I lost it all again the second time. And then I didn't actually file bankruptcy until 2015. So the last time I've had a credit card was February of 2009. So we're talking, what's that, 12 years now. And it destroyed me. When the housing market crashed in California, I had leveraged myself. I had money saved up, but I had leveraged myself. We had done this movie, and it just, we got wiped out. And then, it took me a long time to admit that I had lost. So in theory, I should have filed bankruptcy in June, literally June of 2009. And I remember sitting down with my bankruptcy attorney back then, and I'm a red-blooded American. You know, I pride myself on paying my bills. The reason I had 37 credit cards is because I had an 800 credit score. So I, I knew how to you know, pay my bills on time. I'd gone my whole life. And so I emotionally, could not file. Like I literally had filled out the paperwork, I gave her the check to start the proceedings, and I went back in an hour later and pulled the check and I could do it. So I ruined myself for six more years. And when I say I ruined myself, 
I lived in my own head. I lived in this uh, a stigma that, you know, a red blooded American man, especially a white man, has got to pay his bills and all these stories I heard growing up. Like my grandma or my mother would always tell me the story of my grandfather d during the Great Depression that his proudest moment was he never had a step foot in a bread line. That was his proudest moment of his entire life. So all that psychology kept me from filing bankruptcy. Now, here's the interesting thing. So I didn't use any debt from 2009 to 2015. The only reason I actually finally filed was, and I was paying my $30 a month on my $100,000 debt credit card, you know, trying to keep it alive. Like, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back. And I, the only reason why I filed was I was being arrested for not showing up to a court appointment where the, the uh, judge, so if you've never missed your pill, bills, what happens is you first have your first court appointment where the judge says, is this your debt? And I said, yes, it's my debt. Well, when you have 37 credit cards, you quit going to those appointments. Yes, I know I owe the debt, no problem. What happens is the second time, the second time they have the right to uh, basically forensically go through your accounts to see if you're lying or not. I did show up to that appointment because I didn't know that appointment existed. And when the judge came or the uh, officer came to my house to arrest me in front of my children, that's where I thought, okay, I need to file bankruptcy because there's no way I'm getting out of this. But, and the reason I bring up that whole story is when we're in um, tragedy, when we're stuck in hardship, it's the stupid psychological BS that we were told as our child that holds us there. I would have stayed in that situation for the next 20 years at $30 a month trying to pay off hundreds of thousands of dollars of credit cards. And it wasn't until that massive shift where I'm like, I can't. I went from, from 2008 making no money until 2015, so seven year run of collectively, collectively making maybe, oh, I'd say maybe 30 grand, 40 grand a year collectively each year during that time. 2016, when I finished bankruptcy, I did 600,000, 2017, I did a million. And what was the difference? It wasn't the debt. That wasn't, the, I hadn't had the debt. I mean, I hadn't used the debt in seven years. It was the psychological warfare I was playing in my mind. I was role playing over and over again, all the debt and not thinking about how do I go produce more value for people? As soon as the bankruptcy was done, I kicked in the gear of producing. Well, I have now paid way more of my taxes back to whatever the debt was that's been wiped free and clear. When I went before the judge, the judge said, are these numbers correct? I said, yes, he says, okay. And he stamped it. I, I'm not exaggerating. My bankruptcy took me lo less than three minutes. My attorney turned to me and said, in 20 years, I've never had this happen. Because I hadn't used debt in eight years. To this day, I still don't have a credit card. I don't use debt. I pay cash for everything. So the reality of it, long story short is, stop listening to the voices in your head because they're all wrong. <laughs> Wow. And that's, that's really interesting because I mean, you were the journey of where you were at in a really good spot. What kind of, you talk about the voices in your head, what kind of conversations, what were you hearing when you were at that slump? Right? Because it was, well, I was, I was running a highly successful business and, or multiple businesses and now it's over. Was it, Hey, I'm a one trick pony. You had, it was luck. Right. What was obviously there were lots of conversations going on telling you why you were now, you know, that was it. You, so you, it was the over. first time I went broke in, Yeah, no, the first time I went broke in two, when I was 27. So I made my first million in the dot com dot bomb of 1999. So we had taken a company through the public proceedings process. I had stock. I was worth over a million at 26. I started day trading. I sold my shares to my business partners the stock market crashed and I went completely broke, but I wasn't in debt. So I had no money left. I had two homes, I moved out of them, I rented them out, I moved my parents' basement, I was destitute, but I wasn't, I still had assets I could play with. The second time was the hardest time. And the first time, you're right, I felt like a one trick pony. I was 27 years old, I'm like, I got lucky. Then I got into real estate, real estate investing, and that took us to California. We had a mortgage and real estate firm in seven states. We're doing a hundred million, we did over a hundred million dollars in real estate transactions. And so then I was high on myself. Like I'm like, oh, I've made this, you know, I've got the house, the cars, I've got it all. And when the housing market crashed, I was smart enough to get out of the real estate market in 2005, because it looked just like the, um, the stock bubble. I'm like, I'm out in 05. 
But at 08, I had put all my money into what I was doing now, which is consulting and coaching and writing books. So I've written 42 books, I've done three movies, and this, the movie The Secret had just come out. So we put a million dollars into a movie we had done uh, in the same type of format, interviewing high net individuals, you know, incredible entrepreneurs. And we launched that April 22nd of 2008. So right, I mean, like right when it crashed and all the chips fell and it, I was able to stay afloat for three more years to about 2011, but by then the cars got repossessed, the house got repossessed. And during that time, I knew I wasn't a one trick pony anymore. Like I knew that I had some ability. Uh, this is when I came up with what I call the five currencies. You have mental currency, emotional currency, physical currency, spiritual currency, and financial currency. So in that moment, I didn't have financial currency, but I still had mental currency, emotional, spiritual, and physical. So what I would do with my boys at the time, they were young, young boys, is we'd go to the beach every Friday. I'd find $5, I'd save up, get $5, we'd eat a, a pizza at Little Caesars on the way home. That was dinner and the beach. So it was basically the entire day was $5. Um, for Christmas, my mom gave us an iPad. That's right when iPads first came out. I hawked the iPad and I bought season passes to Disney. So even though we were broke, we still had season passes to Disney because it was a way I could entertain my kids for free. So if you start to realize your other currencies, if you're feeling threatened right now, you may not have financial currency, but you still have mental currency, emotional, spiritual, and physical currency, which is how all currency is made. And the definition of currency is exchange. So right now with Levi and Ryan, what you guys do, you are creating a mental currency. Right now, the topic we're talking about is an emotional currency for people. It's also a physical currency. So you're exchanging these currencies to people to have them go to the championshustlewebsite.com so that they can learn how to get out of the hole that they're in, which will produce a financial currency for them and for you. So if we understand that you don't need money to make money, all you need is currency, then the faster you exchange those currencies, the faster you get results. So I, I love that. We've, we've talked about um, this in the past, that uh, the difference between being broke versus not have uh not having being any poor, money the like, difference be, yeah the difference between poor and broke yeah mm -hmm. that's it i i'm having a brain fart here so and it's it's recorded for all of you to hear again <laughs> <laughs> we all do it <laughs> it's all good but uh yeah i mean it's the difference being between being poor and broke right being being broke is a mindset of um almost being broken right where where your spirit is broken and you you don't have I, I guess the the mental currency or the emotional currency to pick yourself back up and get going again where being poor is just hey it's your current state yeah well, one thing that i love that woody that you said to me years and years ago is that you know i could lose everything to don't tomorrow i could i could lose i could lose my house and my car and my business everything everything that i own all my assets and be standing on the street wearing a scrap of cloth or being naked, nothing, right? Be wearing a garbage bag and I'd be fine because tomorrow I would rebuild. Why? Because even though I have zero, even in that you know, scenario, I have zero financial currency, I still have my experience, my knowledge, my relationships, my contacts. I wouldn't even have a cell phone, but I know people's phone numbers. So I can go borrow somebody's cell phone to start making some calls, to start Absolutely. rebuilding. And that really uh, stuck with me because basically what you're talking about are these currencies is yeah. you've, got, you've got all these, while your, your, your you know, dollars, financial bank account may be empty in that scenario, you still have these massive bank accounts with mental, emotional, physical, spiritual uh, deposits in them with a massive network of, of friends and contacts and relationships that means it doesn't matter what the bank account is. And that's what people need to understand. Money by itself, just money inherently by itself doesn't make more money. So if I have a million dollars cash on the table, it will not duplicate overnight. I can pour water on it. I can do prayers on it. It's not going to do anything. You actually have to apply a mental currency to it. Where do I put that money? Or if it's a physical currency, okay, who do I need to reach out to? Who do I need to talk to? 
a spiritual currency of how do I emotionally handle this without losing it or getting materialistic around it or thinking that I'm something because I have it. So to me, of all the five currencies, the financial is the least important. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would agree. Absolutely. Now, you kind of alluded to it, but let's dive a little bit deeper into let's talk about BS. Can you oh, tell us a little I love about BS. <laughs> Tell us about BS in, <laughs> from your perspective, I know that you've written at least one book about it. I, I know I, that I've read. <laughs> yeah, so here's my favorite story about where I discovered BS. As 11 years old, I had this beautiful Tom Sawyer lie, I'm telling my mom, and I'm following her around the house and she's just getting madder and madder because I did something wrong at school. And she finally just yells at me, she says, that's BS. Now I'm 11 years old, I'm like, I don't know what BS means. So I said, well, what's, what's that mean? And her face just goes ghost white. And she goes, it's your belief system, now go to your room. So all the way through high school, I thought BS was my belief system. And I now just believe it is belief system because it is your BS. Whatever your BS is, it is the way you think. And so you have to learn to challenge that. One of my favorite stories is of Bain Capital. If you're not familiar with Bain Capital, they're the ones who invested $100 million into Staples. They're the ones who turned around Domino's. They're a U.S. investment firm. And a technique that they have is when they're about ready to throw down a ton of money into a company, they'll bring in all the executives, they'll put the business plan on the table, and they'll say one word, challenge. Let's challenge it. And what that means is no matter if you're the CEO of the company or the janitor, doesn't matter, all egos are aside, let's tear this business apart for the sole purpose of making it better. Because a lot of times when we are the CEO of our life and the CEO of our companies, we think that we're so smart, we've got all figured out. But if you say challenge it, what you're saying is, okay, I will be humble enough to take my identity out of this course that I'm on and listen to anyone who has anything to say so that we can make it better. And so what I do now, whenever the BS is, I say challenge it. So I'll go to my friends, I'll go to anybody I know, even though I, I've got something I believe is just the best thing since sliced bread, I'll say challenge it, let's make it better. And in that process, Every time, and I mean 100% of the time, we have found something better. Yeah, it's it's always awesome to to go in and not assume, because you know what happens when we assume, right? Yeah. But uh, really ask questions and figure out, hey, is this the only way? Is this the, the most effective way? Is this the most efficient way to actually do something? And a lot of times when you are willing to challenge that, something even better comes along out of that. Here's a funny story. So where I'm standing in right here is in one of my businesses. So I own a jewelry company, a little side hustle we started during COVID. And um, I have these employees who come in and we package up the product and ship it out. So I taught them the challenge thing. It's okay, guys, I want you to challenge this. Uh, we have a ton of orders that got to get out. Here's the way I normally do it. You show me a faster, better way and we'll go with that. So the ironic thing is they showed me a faster, better way which means they actually worked less hours and I ended up having to pay them less for the day. So it worked out financially for me anyways. Sweet. But it was freaking awesome. And now we will always do that. And now I'll save a little bit of money on the side and then I'll buy them something as a bonus. But it's one of those things where I'm the owner. I think I've got it down right. I think I'm the smartest one in the room. No, 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 no. The person doing the work usually has a better idea. Yeah. And really, the underlying principle there is, uh, I think, humility and coachability, right? And that's and that's one one attribute that I really admire in you, Woody. That that is because I don't know how long we've known each other. When did we meet? Twenty fourteen? It yeah. It would have been it would have been right around thirteen. Thirteen, fourteen. Okay. Yeah. So eight years now. So and so it's it's been interesting. Obviously, we've worked together over the years, um, but but also watching kind of you know different companies that you have you know started and grown and built and 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 so it's interesting to see consistently as we've hung out on you know different beaches around the world or you know in different business environments and settings, and meetings and trainings and things, um, seeing that 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 is a constant for you where you're saying, okay, hey, I've got this idea. This is what I'm going, this is what I'm developing, or this is how I'm improving a current you know, product or service that I'm offering in this business or that business. Tear it apart. What, what's wrong? How can it be improved? And that really, that approach to constantly 
hey, let's make it better, let's make it better, let's make it better. This is my baby. Basically, you're saying, here's my baby. Call my baby ugly. Yeah. Tell me how ugly, why my baby is ugly. And, but by, take, by having that approach, being able to create some incredible phenomenal things. So that's a, that's a huge takeaway for all of our listeners is have Woody's attitude in your business <laughs> and boy, will it pay some dividends. I appreciate that. I'll be honest. It's not humility. It's selfishness. And, and here's why I call the two by four effect. One two by four will break at 427 uh, pounds of pressure. If you nail two two by fours together, it's 1877 pounds. So it's a four and a half time multiple. I know that if I can tap into other people's mental currencies, I will do better. It's just something that I know. I've tested enough times. So I don't care who it is. If I have someone walk into one of my businesses and they seem interested, I'll always ask them, challenge it. Tell me something I don't know. Show, show me something that can make it better. When it comes to Lego, uh, Legos. <laughs> when it comes, so those, those who are listening who don't know me, I have a, a really bad addiction to Legos. I, I went to the Lego store yesterday and dropped a thousand bucks. So I got a real hardcore addiction. Um, logos, like if it comes to logos, I will say, okay, you know, I like this logo. I'm all in on this logo. What do you guys think? My last book that I wrote, Drive Sells. This is my baby. This is something I literally have made millions of dollars with. I have uh, worked with top celebrities, top athletes, the United Nations. This is something I've done for 15 years. But when I wrote the book, I literally posted online. I said, okay, guys, challenge it. Here's the logo. What do you guys – and we literally – hundreds of people tore it apart to make it better. And now I think it's so much better than what I originally came up with because – mental capital other people gave their insight and it was so much better than one person could do yeah so the bottom line is don't be humble be selfish yeah be selfish screw <laughs> you really you never made any rich <laughs> yeah be selfish oh that's classic so back in in your story where you were talking about um how you got back on your feet like you you let go of the mental bs surrounding filing for bankruptcy but I don't know if, if that's like the, the point where things actually started to change. You talked about becoming a producer. It allowed you to have the mental capital to get back into being a producer. And that's, that's one of the ways that I believe is the fastest way to change your own life is becoming a creator of something. So well, talk, I believe I, talk to I'm us so about that process and how that, that was able to get you picked back up again. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you're, you're spot on. So what happened was from 2008 to 2015, I didn't produce anything. Um, I did sign a book deal in 2008 that I had to finish. And so that I finished one book then, but from after that book was finished, I didn't really produce anything. I mean, I didn't make any new games, any new businesses. I was just trying to survive. I was in survival mode, victim mode, just, you know, trying to get by, trying to get by, trying to make a little money here, a little money there, just trying to pay my bills. Uh, it wasn't until I mentally let go of the identity of who I was that I had filed bankruptcy. And and the uh, the weight that that was holding from, and I'll never forget, because it was June of 2015 when it was discharged, the bankruptcy. And it was August of 2015 where I made my first good month. Like I think I made 20 or 30 or 40 grand that first month. And then from then on, it just it just took off. And because what I started doing is instead of spending that time subconsciously. So I my wife and I have this phrase and I, we believe in it to our core. We have what's called subconscious stress. So your mind subconsciously is weighing on that stress. It's thinking about the money you owe, the people you owe, the identity, the failure that you are, the fact that you can read till you're 19 years old, all the stories you tell yourself, you subconsciously replay those over and over again. Well, when you kick that out and the subconscious mind says, oh, hey, okay, we're not worried about the money anymore. We can start producing now. What you do subconsciously is you start creating. You start thinking of how to create value for other people. How do you introduce people to people? How do you find ways out of the hole that you're in? How do you create new opportunity? And we all know this phrase that you can't save yourself to uh, save yourself, can't save up to wealth. You have to be able to produce yourself to wealth. So I just started producing. I think from 15 to now, that's six years, I think I've written... 32 books in that, that amount of time. And not that the books make any money. There's only one or two of those books that ever made any money. But what it did was it got me into the door. So it, it allowed me to meet new people, relationship capital, allowed me to leverage mental capital, allowed me to find different ways to really expand my horizon. And in that expansion, that's where I made the money. 
So a lot of times I think, uh, and speaking out of experience here as well, sometimes when we hit a slump in our business, we get in that woe is me mindset and we're just, it's, it can be really, really difficult to break out of that. So yeah, so thanks for the, the hardest thing is thinking about yourself too much where we're always thinking about ourselves. When you can quit thinking about yourself and it's hard when you're broke, it's hard when you're depressed, it's hard when, you know, it's hard to make the money. I mean, I've been on food stamps, I've been homeless. I, it's hard, trust me, I kid it, it's hard. The fastest way out of it though is how do I create value for other people? People buy things that create value. All of us have a thousand dollar phone. Every freaking phone out there is a thousand dollars. Had you told me when I was younger that I'd carry around a thousand dollar phone? No. You got 11 year old kids carrying around a thousand dollar phone. So what has happened is these companies have created enough value that we as parents will pay $30 a month to give our kid a thousand dollars. My dad wouldn't even let me sit in the front seat of a car, let alone give me a phone. So <laughs> it comes down to, you've got to create value for people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and that mindset of, creation like i didn't even know that you'd written 32 books in in it's the last 32 six years. total but 32 during that right. time yeah right but 32 in the last six years that i haven't even written one yet <laughs> so <laughs> Come on, Levi, i guess i it. better step up my game oh, well here's yeah. the funny thing i tell this to everyone who wants to write a book and i also own a publishing company i've helped 152 people become authors there is no money in books literally there's no money in books the book is a calling card it, all it does is it encapsulates your concepts, your ideas. And I have made so much money, and I mean seven figures type money from handing out my book to people for free. Introductions, opportunities to get in the door. 99% um, of my speaking gigs are because I gave somebody my book first. That's where the money's made with books. Interesting. Well, there's, a, there's a pro tip for you right there. Write a book and start giving it away. That's it. <laughs> so, Woody, um, if hey guys, you, I got time for one last question. I got to wrap it up. I got a hard stop in two minutes. Okay. If um, if you had thirty seconds to speak <laughs> to someone who is a small business owner, a budding entrepreneur, and you just jumped out of the plane and you're like, "Oh crap! I forgot to put a parachute on," which honestly sounds like something that you would actually do. <laughs> totally. Oh man! Totally. <laughs> oh crap! That's right. We were I was supposed to wear a parachute, and you've got thirty seconds as you're free falling to tell that other entrepreneur hey, this is what you need to know to make it in business. You better go because the ground is coming fast. I, okay, so I know this is a parable, but in real life, I would do exactly this. I would <laughs> swim in the air over that person and I would secure myself to him and I would borrow his parachute and we would go down together. And to me, that's what I would do in business. I would find a battle buddy, find somebody who has done what you want to do, get with them, create as much value with them as you can, because that relationship is the two by four effect again. Connect with someone. I don't mean go in there and take over their business. What I mean is go in there and figure out how your business or your skill set can solve their problem. So I believe every entrepreneur is a problem solver. So when I meet with someone, the first question I ask them, what is the number one problem you want solved right now? Because if I can help them solve that problem, we have a relationship, we have a connection. It's funny, I woke up to a dream. I was in Mexico, I was doing one of those zip lines, and I sat down and interviewed the owner, and I was trying to figure out how do I help him expand his business. And the first question in my dream, I literally woke up to this, was asked, what's the number one problem you wanna solve right now? And I started asking all these questions, and by the end of our discussion, by being on a vacation in a dream, he and I were business partners. And that's the way my subconscious mind works. So. Even when I'm awake or asleep, all I think about is how do I create value for them as fast as possible. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Woody. And thank you for all the value that you've brought today to our listeners on the show. We really appreciate your time. And for those of you who are saying, man, this Woody guy is incredible. I want to learn more about him. I want to uh, dive into some of the things that he's doing. Drivesalesbook.com is the place to go. Once again, that is drive, like driving a car, drivesalesbook.com. Woody Woodward is his name. And thank you again, Woody, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in person again very soon. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks. Woody. And if you want to hear more from Woody, remember 
to, to join us in this four day event because Woody is going to be one of the speakers at this event. Yes. So um, you can get connected with him at his book, drivesalesbook.com, and also in at championhustle.com forward slash summit and join us for four days full of awesome training on how to level up your business and then come back next week and we're going to be covering what doesn't kill you makes you stronger love it we'll see you then have a great week guys have a great week everybody bye-bye thank you for joining us on this episode of the champion hustle podcast for more great content and to join our online community visit us at championhustle.com Oh, 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 oh,